I'm sorry, but when you're not uh, a criminal and we're not used to something like this and we're not used to lying or, or being, you know, you should be nervous. You should be nervous to take the stand. Um, Before we roll right into this video, I am going to do my best to briefly bring you up to speed on all that occurred between these two YouTube creators, up to the point and where I chose to start this video at. I am not an expert on anything here, and I can only provide context as far as what I've observed from an outside perspective. And even then, I still haven't seen everything, nor do I even know much about the history that I'm attempting to give you all a summary of. With that disclaimer out of the way, I will do my best to present the events as they occurred based off of my memory and the content that is still public to review. Again, I haven't seen everything, but I believe I have a good enough understanding of what all went down here and able to present to you all my thoughts and opinions as seen through my eyes. Vanessa with Unmasked created a YouTube channel in 2018 and grew pretty quickly by covering the tragic true crime case of Shanann Ruchek and Chris Watts. I am personally more familiar with the series that Unmasked put out about the mistress connected with that case. However, looking back on their channel to see what other content was covered, it appears to me that Vanessa did cover more than just that one case and kept the channel well diversified. I have recently learned that several people associated with Unmasked back in 2018 through 2021-ish, including Vanessa, had been speaking with the Watts side of the family as well as the Ruchek family, so they were able to get both sides of the story, if you will, and from what I can see from briefly looking over the channel, Unmasked only put out fact-based content whenever they did cover that case, and any discussion that occurred about the case was stemmed off of the facts of the case, including what all they had learned and could confirm from what they were told by the families and friends impacted by this case. I believe it was in around the spring or summer of 2021 that Unmasked, specifically Vanessa, had started to distance herself from the Watts family because it had become clear that the Watts were dealing with some pretty toxic people from the internet, and they had been engaging in activities that crossed many boundaries and against many people. Vanessa was put in a position of having to report information to authorities that she had learned after some very concerning details about the case was revealed from a Watts family member to Vanessa and with other unmasked associates at the time as well. After going to the appropriate authorities and putting up the necessary boundaries between herself and the Watts family and friends, Vanessa cut all ties with them completely, moved on, and never looked back as she carried on covering other true crime cases, and her channel continued to do very well. In late November of 2020, Anna Oriani shows up onto YouTube, and her entrance is a rather loud one, especially for being new to YouTube's true crime community. I would say her loud entrance was not a great first impression, as she was very animated and over the top with her enthusiastically crass way of sharing the conspiracy theories that she put together on the same case that Unmasked had covered back in 2018. By 2021, this case had been covered non-stop by so many channels, and it had become nauseating at this point. However, the release of a new Netflix documentary spawned a whole new group of people interested in learning more about this case and they came to YouTube by the hundreds. A lot of us who had been around since at least 2018 had already gone through the process of figuring out who the good true crime creators were and who were the ones to avoid. And in my opinion, the combination of all these new viewers in addition to many new content creators covering this 2018 true crime case, the floodgates had become wide open for status, anything goes. When it came to channels falling into the true crime genre, when they absolutely did not belong in anything true related content, except for true garbage. Lana quickly fell into this category for me personally, but not to the new viewers who really believed that Lana knew what she was talking about. As I covered in chapter one of this series, Lana had become the new spokesperson for the Watts family, and I don't know if the new viewers were aware of just how many of these spokespeople the Watts had gone through by this point, as it was an ever-revolving door, but I believe the new viewers saw Lana as bringing something new to the table when discussing this case. I can't speak for what others were thinking at the time, so I am merely speculating there. 
Anyway, Lana was announcing this big news that she was going to be this hero to give Chris Watts the opportunity to file for a 35C motion for post-conviction release, despite many of us already hearing about this possibility months before Lana came around. In any event, the idea of this 35C motion was absurd considering the amount of charges Chris Watts had against him, even if the courts did entertain the first version of his confession. He still had a lifetime of sentences for everything else he did to his family. As I also covered in previous chapters, Lana's big moment to become YouTube famous was a flop, and she turned her channel from true crime to true drama, accusing everyone else on this platform for her failures, instead of just accepting the fact that this is just not her gig. The exposing of Lana's Shazam videos was enough to lose any credibility that Lana might have had, but the optics of Shazam and the Watts working together was even worse. I'm grateful. Grateful dad. <laughs> Those are my favorite. I'm gratefully dead. <laughs> I'm gratefully dead, guys. But yeah, Jamie finally came over to the other side. She apologized for Nutgate. Um, Sissy Two Gate, we're gonna still talk about that, but she finally apologized about Nutgate. Um, razor blades, Nutgate. <laughs> I got a full apology and I'm gonna get it live for you. Can you please tell the audience how you apologize about Nutgate? Guys, I just, um, it's been a long week, like I said. I'm just gonna let loose. Um, I think I'm gonna adopt a child. I just got so many amazing ideas for 2021. I'm just really looking forward to, you know, reinventing myself, um, getting out of my comfort zone. Thanks. And this is March 7th, uh, 2021. Okay, so this is me and Ronnie talking about the website. So this right here said that the Watts had no idea they were just, uh, Oh wait, what was the word she used? Oh, that I was just forging their signature <laughs> about the website. I'm bringing stuff to the family as far as uh, knowledge and uh, this is what's really going on and I think that we need to talk about this. Without the website, I just, I, I mean, I just Chris yesterday, without the website, like we don't have shit. Yeah, I don't know what I was trying to, somebody's having a real bad time with all this, about the money and all this type stuff, so she was upset. It's quoted $200,000. Maybe the friends and family shouldn't be defaming the website that is designed to come up with the money. Legally, trackable, that probably be number one. The Wattses are too nice to literally say, go F yourself. I was able to get Jane and her firm to, instead of having $200,000 right up front in order to even like step into this role, I said, Jane, I believe that we can raise this money. It's going to take us a couple months. Let's work on da, 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 this part of, you know, can we do it like this? Um, and they said, yes. Again, is that my job? Fuck no, it's not my job. Oh, she was upset with me. She said, you don't put all this money there, all the money's gonna be gone. I'm gonna try to explain to her that, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but. We won't put the 30,000 in there. And once the website gets up, we get that back, correct? Yes. That's what it was Yeah. So that's what I was trying to explain to her. Yeah. But it, she, she just wants to make sure everything's legal and people can come back so we put the money in there and took money out of the website. No, no, no. I, that's what I was trying to tell her. I was like, she's like, no, we, we're going to put it in, but we don't want anything back. I'm like, Cindy, it's not about that. It's about, it's, it, uh, we, I can't launch this site. I mean, I could, but without the lawyers' names, like, I mean, that, that, that's just like, that's career suicide. If, if I was to launch the website two weeks ago without the lawyers' names attached, people are going to be like, we want, you want us to donate to what? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to say that. Like, you're, and then they're going to be like, wait, I thought you already had lawyers. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, we do, but we need the money to get, I mean, tell everybody that, listen, we put the deposit down for the lawyers, which is the first 50000 In order for us to keep this going on, we need support from people. If you want justice, I'm asking you to please support it. Why would I ever fill out a 501c3 for a family I don't know? I'm, my my name's attached to it. Ronnie, it's very simple. It's very simple. What is that? What is that 501 c thing you're talking about? What is that? The, you, you have to have a 501c in order to get a nonprofit like license. 
I was a, I was approved for it, and I got it. And when people are asking me questions about it, I'm like, yeah, it's right there. Like, it's just go on the site. Once you're on the site, if you can't see it, and you don't want to be a part of it, then don't be a part of it. It's all right there. Like, it's all going to be on the site. Like, I went into Lana's chat using an alt account and started to ask her questions about the Fight for a Family website due to my skepticism for its legitimacy, and Lana got pretty annoyed with me. Lana is not a fan of being challenged by anyone who might know more than she does, and she became very rude in her responses to my very direct yet simple questions to her about her website. Since I was so skeptical of this whole nonprofit organization and the website that Lana was soliciting for people to sign up for, I went to the Fight for a Family website myself, since I was unable to get any clear answers directly from Lana herself. To protect my identity, I proceeded onto the website, continuing to use that same alt name that I was previously using while in Lana's live stream chat. I found that the website didn't contain anything that Lana said that it did, and I was somehow able to sign up for a membership using that fictitious alt name. I did, however, use my real billing address and credit card information, but that should have still been flagged as fraudulent if the website was as secure as Lana claimed that it was. The next thing that happens is that Lana made a community post on her YouTube channel congratulating this alt name for becoming a new member of Fight for a Family. I then went into Lana's next live stream chat, telling her that I didn't appreciate her publicly putting my name out there like that. Whether it was my real name or not, that's not the point. Lana had told everyone that she didn't have access to any of this information and promised that her website was secure, safe as Netflix and Under Armour, and that all of your personal information was stored through a third party, and any of your information could only be accessed if it had been flagged for fraudulent activity. So if that was the case, then how did my payment go through without any issue, and how could Lana congratulate this alt name, or anyone for that matter, so quickly after this fictitious person became a new member of Fight For A Family, if she didn't have immediate access to your information. Lana proved that her reassurances that a third party is who stores all of your personal information was just not the case at all. Not only did Lana just publish this name on a public website for all to see and without my permission, but nowhere did it state in any terms of service on her website that she had permission to publish any names of those who had signed up for her nonprofit website. How many times have you heard Lana say that your personal information is held by a third party and not accessible to her for just any reason? Lana's actions by publishing this name on her community page on YouTube also prove that if you are someone who does not just blindly go along with what Lana says and you don't accept Lana's answers and you dare to challenge her to explain further, Lana will use your personal information against you just as she did in that community post publishing that name without my consent, which came across as a veiled threat to me. I can understand that when viewing this from an outside perspective, how that wouldn't necessarily be perceived that way, but if it was your name and you didn't want to be publicly known for helping to fund this cause and had a rather rough exchange with Lana just hours prior to the posting of your name, then maybe you'd see this the same as I did and the point that I'm making here. After the posting of this fictitious name on her community post, I did email Lana asking to be refunded for the membership that I had just purchased due to my disappointment of the unauthorized publishing of my name and new membership status with Fight for a Family without my consent. Again, it doesn't matter if the name was my real name or not, because at that time, Lana didn't know herself that this was a fictitious name. It's the fact that Lana has been lying to her own people about what information she has access to once anyone signs up for a membership to her nonprofit website. Anyway, I requested a refund via email since that is what Lana has also repeatedly promised would be an option for anyone to do anytime and without question. However, that turned out to be a lie as well since she has yet to reimburse me for the money I paid towards this membership. Lana is now even going as far as to tell me that she would never accept my money. 
since she has learned who had really paid for a membership for her website. Lana has tried to spin this into the narrative that I was setting her up, however, what seems to be getting missed here is that if everything was on the up and up, as Lana claimed everything was, then there was no way for me to set up Lana for shit or for any of this to have happened. I just busted Lana for the fraud and the liar that she is. Today the 15th. Good morning, our security systems have flagged the transactions below, therefore EMS will need to verify the cardholder information connected with this card is correct because of the amount. Please respond to this email by providing an invoice and our sales receipt that includes the cardholder's billing information, i.e. name, address, and contact number associated with the credit card, associated with the credit card, associated with the credit card, as well as the good services that your business has provided for. Okay. I still do not understand why the Watts do this to themselves, ask for help, but end up turning to the worst people who have zero credentials to help anyone. And most of them can't even help themselves get out of their own simple, stupid, struggled life. But I digress. As far as I'm aware, Vanessa and Lana did not cross paths for most of 2021. Unmasked was in a much higher class of the true crime genre than Lana, and I do not recall ever hearing about any drama going on with Unmasked for as long as the channel had been around. Lana, on the other hand, was nothing but drama, and was incessantly talking about taking this creator, or that creator down, or just burning down Watts Island completely. Lana was always in status struggle, and had to resort to mingling with the lower class of YouTube creators to try and get subscribers off of them. This of course only led to more drama. The only interactions between Vanessa and Lana that occurred that I'm aware of before shit got crazy stupid was when another problematic creator had a falling out with Lana, and this creator for some reason put Vanessa's full name in the thumbnail of an upcoming live stream that she was advertising, and Lana's exposed butt crack from her drooping bedazzled jeans was screen grabbed from one of her live streams and was part of this creator's thumbnail as well. It is my understanding that this was the first time that Vanessa had ever talked with Lana, and only did so in hopes that through both of them reporting this live stream, that it would get the live stream or image of this thumbnail removed sooner. Vanessa's last name was not common knowledge at this time, and from what I've learned about Vanessa through her court testimony is that she values her privacy and has always kept her personal life separate from YouTube. This is a huge contrast to how Lana operates, however, and is probably why Lana lacks the ability to appreciate that there is safety in having some privacy and good practice to keep your personal life separate from your YouTube content. The only other account of anything being said about Vanessa and Lana before November-December of 2021 was when Lana first launched her non-profit website, Vanessa had a private live stream through her Patreon to warn her subscribers, that she actually does care about, to be careful about signing up for the website because Lana had just recently been exposed for leaking images of people's driver's licenses and that belonged to the subscribers of Lana's Facebook group. Taking that into consideration, and the fact that Lana's website was asking for credit card information, billing address, etc., plus Vanessa having her own experience dealing with the Watts, who were supposedly co-signing this website, it seems like a completely rational thing for Vanessa to have done at the time, to help keep her supporters safe from any potential fraud. And, as it turns out, Vanessa wasn't wrong at all for warning her supporters to be careful with Lana's sketchy-ass website, in my opinion. In October of 2021, Lana had this grand idea to host this award ceremony night where she planned to give these channels awards for different categories based on the viewers' votes. Lana was advertising this as a way to bring the true crime community together. Vanessa had no desire to be of any part of this for the simple fact that she never was okay with how Lana mocked Shanann and the girls after death. Vanessa did not want to associate her channel or brand with Lana Oriani, her YouTube channel Truth and Transparency, or her bogus nonprofit. Bogus is my adjective, not Vanessa's. Just reminding everyone that everything I'm stating here is from my perspective 
viewpoint, and opinion. It was at this time that there were some private matters going on with the inner circle of Unmasked that Vanessa was quietly and privately sorting out. However, unbeknownst to her, one of her good friends at the time had been speaking with Lana behind the scenes and spilling all of the tea that was none of anyone's business outside of who all it involved, let alone that beast Lana Oriani. This friend also showed up to Lana's award ceremony live stream on YouTube and accepted the award for Best True Crime Channel, representing the unmasked brand in place of Vanessa. This also did not go over well because this award ceremony live stream was just a lazy way to try and get Unmasked's name associated with Lana's channel. It was also a clout chasing and money grab more than a bringing the community together kind of event. Since Lana made the event members only, which means you can't participate unless you are a paying member of her channel, and the votes by the viewers had to be submitted via super chat donations to Lana's channel. Yeah, sleazy and cheap move right there. So after this event is when I recall that Lana went weird and started to just go ham on trying to get Vanessa's attention. Lana was once again focusing on this sex scandal panel that happened back in May of 2021 and later seemingly worked out by the parties involved in that situation. But Lana, out of nowhere, was trying to relitigate this whole thing on YouTube for the hundredth time, but was now dragging Vanessa and her channel into this mess. Lana was incessantly tagging the unmasked channel dropping subtle comments about those private matters that only a select few from Unmasked's inner circle knew about, and the attention-seeking behavior ramped up big time from this point forward. I believe that Vanessa agreed to do a phone call with Lana, believing that if she just appeased her, then maybe Lana would leave her and her channel alone afterwards. Vanessa arranged for Lana to sign a non-disclosure agreement to legally protect any private information that might be discussed during their phone conversation. Again, Vanessa had put up boundaries to keep a safe distance between her and the Watts, so I believe that Vanessa was just following the same practice when dealing with Lana Oriani. Vanessa endured roughly 10 hours of an emotionally manipulative phone conversation, found herself repeatedly having to avoid Lana's invasive and intrusive questions about her sources on the Watts case, and then Lana tried to tell Vanessa all about those private matters that occurred between some of the inner circle of Unmasked as if that was any of Lana's business. After all of that, I believe that Vanessa must have thought that Lana got the attention that she wanted, and the apology that she felt entitled to receive for warning her Patreon members about Lana's website. But no, no, I believe that everyone, including just a viewer such as myself, was absolutely God-smacked to learn just how insane Lana truly is. This was still just the beginning of a hell that I'm sure Vanessa could never have ever imagined. Working with Lana to get YouTube to act on a privacy matter or appeasing Lana with a phone call is one thing, but supporting someone who mocks murdered victims? Yeah. No. That's just not going to happen. I'm pretty certain Vanessa drew a hard line there, and that's what gave Lana the green light to attack Vanessa and attempt to destroy her channel's reputation and her character, as it became apparent real quick that this is what Lana had been plotting to do for some time. I believe that it was the entire month of December 2021 that Lana started doing live stream after live stream, attacking unmasked Vanessa and anyone who was friends with Vanessa. Lana was using those private matters between consenting adults that resulted in one chick crossing state lines just to vandalize another girl's car over a guy. Yeah, Lana was now making this her profitable YouTube content. Lana was trying to paint Vanessa's friend of 10 plus years to be this villain based off of bad information that she was being fed by people who turned out to never be a true friend of Vanessa's, and was now trying to become a channel competitor and using Lana as her weapon. Lana outed one of Vanessa's friend's sexuality and relationship with another friend of Vanessa's just to be a dick. Lana truly is a shitbag for doing that and did not have the right to do that, ever. It gets worse. Lana plays selected parts of that 10-hour phone call on her channel, which was not meant to be turned into content, then Lana starts accusing Vanessa's friend of being a predator with zero proof to back up those claims. In my opinion, Lana was just projecting what she does herself onto Vanessa's friend. Lana then starts accusing Unmasked of being this mob-like channel that has the power to cancel other channels and claimed that Vanessa had been trying to take down Lana. Yeah, it's insane conspiracy shit, but this is how Lana's brain works being revealed in real time. Lana accuses Vanessa for setting up this sex panel scandal which is absurd. How does anyone set up Lana to share someone's nudes? 
Again, Lana can never just admit that she's an idiot and never takes accountability for own fails and crimes. In my opinion, of course. Lana then goes undercover and poses as Nessa's friend's wife just to get her hands on a receipt for tires purchased through a major tire chain. Lana is trying to get any information that she can get off of this receipt of her friend. Why is she obsessing so much about her and friend? My opinion is because this sad sack of shit has never had a friend for 10 years, so she's projecting her fail once again onto others. This entire time, Vanessa has continued to ignore her and on or about December 21st, 2021, Vanessa officially blocks Lana from ever being able to contact her again and to give her the loud and clear message that she is not going to be bullied into supporting Lana's channel or bullshit nonprofit. This is when shit gets really bad and the full extent of Lana's stalking of Vanessa, her family, her friends, her past business partners, and more. It becomes very clear by Lana Oriani's December 29th, 2021 livestream just how long Lana has been waiting to do this and who might be behind Lana encouraging all of this. On December 29th, 2021, Lana goes absolutely mental and starts to unravel as she's talking directly to Vanessa, as if Vanessa is sitting right there listening. It's really weird if you think about it. This person talking to outer space just assuming the other person is listening intently. Yeah, that's just weird to me, but anyway. Lana reveals that she's had a photo of Vanessa's husband since December of 2020 and put it in one of her disgusting Shazam videos. Why? Well, her excuse makes literally no sense at all, but it's clear to me that the real purpose was to get Vanessa's attention. Then, thanks to Vanessa's not a good person ex-friend, Lana now has a bunch of screenshots taken from several of Vanessa's group chats, and Cherry picks things that were flippantly said amongst friends, but I don't recall seeing Vanessa in those screenshots. Just as a side note about group chats for anyone who doesn't know, if you have multiple people chatting in a group chat, you can get behind really quickly with as much as everyone types, and if they have a lot of time to chat away. Even if your name is tagged in Facebook Messenger, you will still miss the comment, as Messenger doesn't automatically take you directly to where your name is tagged. I know Lana believes it's impossible for Vanessa to miss anything in her group chats, but since Lana doesn't have many friends, this is probably why she doesn't comprehend how busy and cluttered group chats can get some days. Lana starts to speak of evidence that she has and threatens to go on. Lana says she has medical evidence. What the fuck? How many people's medical records does she have and why does she have them? Lana continues to try to triangulate Vanessa, your friends, saying things like, you can thank, redacted, for this live stream. I still am unclear what is even meant there other than a friend of Vanessa's on her own made a short 30 second max parody video of Lana's dry, brittle, unbrushed hair. My point is, I haven't seen Vanessa or any of Vanessa's friends do anything to warrant this full-on assault against them. Lana's friend and process server threatens to have Vanessa's friend's United States temporary visa taken away. For what? People who once talked to Lana began sending Vanessa proof of the physical threats Lana was making towards Vanessa and said she was driving to Colorado. Lana has also been making similar threats during her live streams. Lana might live 1,000 plus miles away, but when someone shows you all of the personality traits of one who has a personality disorder on the severe end of the spectrum, you just don't ignore threats like that. So we've reached the point in time that Vanessa was frightened enough to get a restraining order. This was never about silencing Lana as Lana tried to spin the narrative. Lana shouted repeatedly that she's never even met Vanessa, but that's the whole point. It is concerning, alarming, and disturbing that you have zero connection with Vanessa, yet she has Vanessa's background information pulled. She has a photo of her husband in a video she made in 2020, before Vanessa even knew who Lana was. Lana says she has medical records. Lana has information about Vanessa's past business partners. Lana is making threats that she's going to drive to Vanessa's home and physically harm her. Lana lies and said Vanessa talked about her son, but never shows the proof, not even in court. So yeah, I think a restraining order was appropriate for Vanessa to get against Lana and a judge agreed. A judge agreed that, that this complete stranger on the internet who has been viciously attacking Vanessa and has all of this personal information on her that a stranger shouldn't have. That stranger needed to be restrained before it escalated any further. For two years, I never knew Vanessa's last name, nor did it ever cross my mind as a wonder. The sad thing is, most of what I know about Vanessa came from Lana or from court testimony. I know I said in the beginning that I would try to keep this brief, but I fail miserably at this every time. 
There is just so much, and trying to condense everything down is very difficult, and I fear I might leave an important detail out. I do apologize. I just like to be thorough and be as clear as possible as to how we got to this point in this chapter. So, typically when one gets served with a temporary restraining order, and now facing an upcoming hearing to determine the length of the restraining order, one tends to self-reflect and readjust their tood. But no, not Lana. Lana sees the opportunity to turn this whole situation into more content. Lana blames how a process server did his job, and blames Vanessa for her son being scared. I don't want to minimize what that child might have felt, but I do question how she missed this process server if she has all the security cameras that she bragged about having installed roughly six months prior to this date. Was attempt of service made prior to Lana going online and avoided being served earlier that day? Why did she start that particular live stream off, saying that she was playing hide and go seek? Why in that live stream was her son around the whole time when he typically isn't? If I was a conspiracy theorist like Lana, I'd swear that she planned to be served while online for everyone to see. Or maybe I don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to know that that's just how Lana operates. In any event, this temporary restraining order did not phase Lana in the slightest. Lana continued to do marathon long live streams, holding a mock trial where she had her mods play Vanessa's friends being questioned. Lana made sure to show off her fancy tree killing skills with her binder assembling. Lana bragged about how much Vanessa's lawyer's bill would cost due to them having to watch her long live streams. Lana tried to intimidate Vanessa multiple times to dismiss the case. Lana started a fundraiser accusing Vanessa of traumatizing her son for how the process server did his job. Lana was threatening to subpoena anyone and everyone who had ever messaged with Vanessa. It was non-stop harassment. Then, Lana tried to subpoena Vanessa's husband and minor daughter. That brings us to the start of this chapter, which I'm calling Good God Almighty Cunt. On March 1st, 2022, Lana is live streaming again, this time to update her audience about the emergency motion for the subpoena of the minor daughter to be quashed. Lana is trying to garner sympathy from her audience, saying how unfair this is. Even more alarming is the audience actually buying this bullshit and agreeing that blocking Lana's ability to question this minor child on the stand is somehow unjust. Let this sink in. Lana is days away from turning 40 years old and she's pissed that her attempt to harass and intimidate a minor kid is not fair. These grown ass adults are agreeing with her. This is another reason why I will not be covering Lana indefinitely, because the ignorance is strong over there in that alternate truth world of Lana's. So I start the video off covering Lana's disappointment in not being able to scare a child in court and then recap parts of the December 29th, 2021 livestream before moving on to show you all the most perjury I've ever witnessed one person commit in my life in just a small portion of the court proceedings of the retaliatory restraining order that Lana filed against Vanessa in Ohio in 2023. Keep in mind, the only connection that Lana has to Vanessa is the Watts family and only Vanessa can fill in those details that I'm lacking here, but I can't help but feel that they have a part in what's been going on between Lana and Vanessa, and possibly in concert with some of Vanessa's ex-channel friends as well. So grab a snack, or maybe tequila, because we're just getting started here. With, you have to prove things. So I don't, I don't know how you prove a lot. I don't know how you prove stuff like this. Well, I'll show Lana how it's done. Take notes. I've been making it a point to, to reach out and keep in contact with attorneys that are involved with this case. And um, I had to supply a potential witness list. And on that witness list, um, it featured, you know, I think eight to 10 names. <clears throat> and then in, on February 18th and February 22nd, um, I had an associate go down, because obviously I don't live in Denver. Um, did the paperwork for a couple of subpoenas, and then this person went down to the clerk of courts and was to, to file and get um, these subpoenas, you know, going. And the clerk of courts, uh, you know, issued said subpoenas. 
Uh, there was out-of-state ones that I, I wanted to obtain, and there was issues with getting out-of-state uh, subpoenas. But <clears throat> just yesterday, I received a emergency motion. And emergency motion to quash subpoena for minor child prior to service. Um, number one, this matter is set for hearing on whether the existing temporary restraining order issued by this court should be made permanent on March 7th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Um, number two, the undersigned reviewed the online filings in this case today and learned that Ms. Oriani sought and obtained subpoenas for um, the husband of VW and VW's minor daughter. Both subpoenas were issued by the clerk of court on February 18, 2022. This case, number three, this case involves Ms. Oriani's fixation on and stalking of VW, including via her YouTube channel, Truth and Transparency. And Vanessa are friends now because she has a soft spot for um, people that try to mess with her brand. She has a soft spot for that she takes on as friends, but that's what she told me. Oh, is that, is that fact? She's, were you like, who's this Lana bro in November? I mean, like, who's Lana? Well, how about this, Vanessa? You saw the trailer that I did. I dare you and encourage you to come take a ride with me. trailer that I did and something that I put in that trailer that is money now to this day is sent me a picture of Vanessa's husband and what did I do I put Vanessa's husband that picture in my trailer in my uh, Shazam what a day trailer wouldn't you if you were Vanessa nobody's gonna know who her husband is except for Vanessa if you watch this trailer, it's two minutes long and I'm gonna play it. And you see a picture of your husband, wouldn't you say, oh, wouldn't you call up your business partner? Holy shit, what is this trailer? Did you see? Did you see the part at one minute and 19 seconds? Looks like nobody knew. So I go ahead and I put a picture of in this trailer. And I thought to myself, and I had an aha moment. Vanessa never went to anybody, nobody, and never said a word about the fact that her husband's picture was in the trailer. But don't you think it's weird that Vanessa never mentioned the fact that it was in this video? Her husband's been out of the picture for four years. Um, shell of news to find out that, you know, he was just at the house and someone had just talked to him and that he may live in an apartment, um, but he pays all the bills, all of them. Vanessa has a family. One question for you, is James your boyfriend? No. Maybe I should have asked, is James your fiance? Maybe she looked at it as a technicality and, and how she could say no. Regardless, are you in a relationship with James? Nope. No. Okay. And so this is what your friend's doing to me. Oh, well, we were on the impression that that you, that I did what? I must have got it wrong. Oh, you, you, no, hang on. Just realized. What? Um, I 
I don't want to talk to you anymore. Vanessa, you can no longer claim stupid. You can no longer claim dumb. Actually, you might want to claim that you're stupid, but you, there's no longer claiming that Vanessa is in charge of Unmasked, did not know what was going on. It was right in your mind, chat. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys know where Vanessa came from? If you don't give me this, I'll do this. I'll call your husband. I'm gonna ruin your marriage. I'll do this, I'll do that. Your channel is nothing. Meanwhile, I'll be writing up my complaint and filing it against you and your boyfriend. I mean, do you want me to go on? Vanessa, that's bad. But you know what? There's evidence of it. There's medical evidence of things. I'll just leave it, I'll leave it like that. I mean, do you understand what that is? That's called blackmail. That's extortion. People need to open up their eyes. Blank is a minor child. She has no knowledge about this case or the allegations underlining it. Her name has not been disclosed to Ms. Oriani prior to or during the course of this case. It is unknown how Ms. Oriani learned Blank's name Blank's name is not mentioned in any pleadings. VW does not have a personal relationship with Miss Oriani. The very fact that Miss Oriani has somehow found out VW's daughter's name is by itself concerning. Five. Ms. Oriani's choice to request and obtain subpoenas for VW's husband and minor child is troubling and it is a continued effort to stalk, harass, and intimidate VW. Part of the basis for obtaining the temporary protection order in this case was VW's concerns about Ms. Oriani's conduct vis-a-vis -vis her husband and concerns about potential contact with her minor child. Those concerns were well-founded, as is shown by Ms. Oriani's efforts to use this case to harass and stalk VW through her husband and her child using subpoenas obtained from this court. Um, it is inconceivable, number six, it is inconceivable that VW's minor child could have any information relevant to this case. As this court is aware from the complaint filed by VW and from the January 14th, 2022 hearing before this court, this case does not in any way involve VW's minor child. Hmm. I'm going to read this again. Lana went on a live broadcast and began another rant about me and said she's going to bury me. She has told me and others multiple times that she's coming to Denver in the immediate future. I do believe when she comes to Denver, she will come to my home. I've had to show my daughter a picture of her in case she comes here, which has caused her unnecessary stress. She's afraid to answer the door. Moving on, number seven. Undersigned counsel hereby makes an offer of proof that blank does not know anything or possesses any information that would be relevant to the court's determination in this case. While Ms. Oriani's subpoena is unenforceable on its face, as it does not comply with the relevant rule regarding service of process to minors. VW, nonetheless. I'm a terrible person. Yeah. I'm not gonna punch you in the face. Yeah.
But I'm not going to go out of my way to make you feel good. <laughs> This picture that you just emailed is now um, going to be Respondents Exhibit C. Go ahead. Okay. Ms. Oriani, so Truth and Transparency is your okay. YouTube channel, right? Truth and Transparency, 47 seconds ago. That's what I said. Ms. Oriani, I'm asking you a question. Truth and Transparency is your YouTube channel, correct? Yes. And it says, so, and that's a photo of you, right? In the no, it is circle. not a photo of me. Like the pit, like what do you, there, this is a t-shirt. I'm gonna need a stiff drink to get through this. Stiff. VW nonetheless requests that this court quash the subpoena prior to any attempt at service. <clears throat> Serving a subpoena for this type of proceeding upon a minor is harassing. It amounts to a threat calculated to cause VW to dismiss this case. Is that if you don't show up for court, it just gets, you know, it gets thrown out. Um, so I guess my question is, 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 you know, would you show up in, in, in why? What, I mean, Perjury. I mean, do people not know what perjury is? I'm just curious. I don't know. I don't even know. Maybe people don't even know what perjury is. Maybe people don't give a shit. And then since I'm in Denver, I want to go ahead and I want to file my complaint. I'm going to give Denver jurisdiction. I'm going to give Colorado jurisdiction. And I want to file my complaint while I'm in Colorado on unmasked and the members. This isn't just a PPO. But more importantly, if you don't go to a judge and write and lie and say that you are in fear of your life, a judge doesn't see intimate danger. Like, why would they need to enforce a temporary, you know, protection order? But when you uh, threaten bodily harm, that actually becomes, like, that's where it is then criminal. That I can't go around anybody for a hundred, you know, a hundred, uh, what was it, yards or whatever. I think that's insane. Um, <clears throat> um, but so I want right there like where's the credibility then in anything that you're going to say so i believe that vanessa is one option and that option is probably not to you know if you don't show up then you don't have to testify you know it just it gets dismissed and then the judge can either dismiss it with prejudice or dismiss it without prejudice service upon the minor even of an invalid and unenforceable subpoena would cause her harm and upset. Number 10. Miss Oriani herself has posted online content stating that the service of the complaint in this case to her while her minor son happened to be present traumatized her son. She solicited contributions online for payment of her quote unquote legal fees in this case under the slogan justice for jacks openly referencing her son's supposed quote unquote trauma caused by a process server knocking on the door no one answered the door so her son did not meet the process server <laughs> miss oriani's son was not the target of any service Mr. Oriani's Justice for Jack's PayPal request for funds can be found here. Although, upon information and belief, Ms. Oriani has in fact not retained counsel in this case. Her PayPal account states in part, quote unquote, help my son and I fight the dishonest paperwork of Vanessa of Unmasked. I have retained the best. Please help a mother keep, keep the best 
for her innocent little man. Keep. <clears throat> Number 11. This case has nothing to do with Miss <laughs> child and it has nothing to do with Miss Oriani's child. Miss Oriani's instance that this case is somehow harmful to her child when it is not renders her attempt to involve Miss <laughs> child in this case even more alarming. It shows clearly that Miss Oriani's only motivation for obtaining a subpoena for this minor is to cause fear and harm to this minor and to Miss Wall. Number 12. Although the subpoena to Mr. is also harassing and serves no conceivable legitimate purpose. Argument related to that matter will be reserved for after service is completed pursuant to the normal operations of the rules of civil procedure. Welcome to Truth and Transparency. I'm a snake. I'm a super slithery snake. I'm a super sneaky snake. I'm a slithery sneaky snake. I'm a snake. I'm a slither in your garden. I'm a slither around your lettuce and your carrots. I'm a catch in your mouse. Cause I'm a snake. Undersigned counsel hereby makes an offer of proof that this minor does not know anything or possesses any information that would be relevant to the court's determination in this case. Um, I ask in chat that you refrain from any comments. This is just about facts here. So I will ask that um, my mods be deleting any comments. I have not been taking a look at chat, but this has to do with we're sticking to the facts. Yeah. I don't understand how somebody is going to tell me, or the courts rather, why I did something. You have no idea why I did or didn't do something. But your this is your assumption of why I did something and why I didn't do something. Um, number one. I have the phone call recorded when she says her own daughter's name so I just blow it just blows my mind <laughs> we've had over right around at least 10 hours worth of phone conversation I mean at least but But guess what if we have no personal relationship and there's no I mean like what, what's the problem what's going on here uh, but let's just let's just go back to this one more time your daughter has no knowledge she has no knowledge about this case or the allegations underlining it I've had to show my daughter a picture of her in case she comes here which has caused her unnecessary stress She's afraid to answer the door. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... <laughs> what is happening? Oh God, what is happening? This is the worst. Oh, my life! I'm 40, about to be 40 years old. 
in my 40 years of life, soon to be 40 years of life, my parent, neither one of them, has ever came to me when I was 14 years old or 15 or 12 or 10 or, you know, six or 17, um, any point when I was a minor and showed me a picture of somebody and said, hey, by the way, if you see this person, don't answer the door. Like, wait, what? Why? And who is this person? Now, it's March 1st, guys. It's March 1st. I did this paperwork. And, and, we're, and was down there, February 18th, February 18th. So, and for the record, in order to serve a minor, you have to serve both minor uh, parents. That's how, you, you have to do it the right way. I know that. She hasn't even been, she hasn't been served yet. I know, like, how you have to do it. I don't do think she's been served yet. Well, maybe because I don't know where she lives. Maybe because I don't know where her dad lives. Maybe because I don't know where her mom lives. Maybe that's why what was obtained on February 18th um, and no traction and treading with it. Because I simply don't know where these people live. Thank you. Does it scare anyone else that this can happen in a court of law? Does it scare anybody else that between the service of the temporary restraining order to the restraining order hearing, Lana continued to bring a lot of attention to this matter by writing out these long screeds on her community page, lashing out at unmasked Vanessa and anyone who appeared to be supporting Vanessa, as well as covering the matter daily on her YouTube channel. In direct contrast to Lana's behavior, Vanessa was quiet, and I never saw Vanessa put out any content that contributed to bringing any attention to this protection order hearing. Any content that I did see regarding this matter and that might have come from friends or supporters of Vanessa was content that was made in response to Lana's ridiculous allegations with proof backing up their points being made in their videos, but there was no evidence that any of these videos were produced by the order of Vanessa. In my opinion, Lana just couldn't handle the fact and reality that a lot of people didn't like her or the things she was doing. Were some videos a little petty, not gentle towards Lana's feelings, or sometimes antagonistic? Sure, but those videos would have never been made if not for Lana's actions and behavior occurring first. Lana tried to cry daily that she was this victim of this organized effort to take her down, when in reality what was happening was people making videos in response to all of the venom and bullshit that Lana was spewing on her channel about unmasked Vanessa and about her friends and supporters. Lana pissed off a lot of people, and yeah, a few reacted in video format disputing everything Lana was claiming, or just making parody videos about her. For someone who claims to be so confident, Lana's ego sure is fragile. Just saying, let me be clear here. It is serious delusional thinking to actually believe that there was an organized and systematic operation designed to take down Lana Oriani, as Lana was claiming Vanessa to be, as if she was some sort of mob boss-like character and was this mastermind and orchestrator of this so-called Operation Takedown Lana Oriani. The simplest explanation is that a few people just didn't like what all Lana was saying and doing, and acting on their own free will, refused to remain silent and was not going to be intimidated by Lana Oriani, while Vanessa was remaining quiet as she waited for her day in court. Vanessa showed much restraint and handled herself with grace during those months of Lana's assault on her channel and of her character. Lana has never produced evidence, ever, to support her claims against Vanessa, not even when it really mattered, which was in a court of law. Speaking of the court of law, and how a rational and well-adjusted individual typically respects the court's rules and civil procedures, Lana clearly is not one of those individuals. Lana ignored the court's orders to quash Vanessa's minor child subpoena, and went ahead to have it served anyway. Lana sent her friends on a mission to serve the quashed subpoena of the minor child, as well as the subpoena for Vanessa's husband the night before the protection order hearing. 
The attempt of service on Vanessa's husband was well outside of the parameters of timely service, rendering the husband's subpoena quashed as well. But the attempt of service the night before the hearing also included that ordered by the court quashed subpoena for the minor child. A temporary restraining order was very much in place, and Lana chose to disregard the seriousness of that order. The court found that Lana's games of sending her friends to Vanessa's home the night before the hearing was solely for the purposes of harassment and with intent to intimidate Vanessa into dropping her case. Lana was now facing possible charges of contempt for breaking the temporary restraining order by a third-party contact and tried to play stupid about it and discarded the one friend who was not as aggressive of a person as her other friend was, who was also Lana's hired process server. Lana made Vanessa's case against her, pretty easy by showing the judge just how unhinged and delusional she was in real life. Vanessa was granted a lifetime protection order against Lana Oriani, but shit didn't end there either. Immediately after the hearing, and while still in Colorado, Lana held another live stream announcing her plans to appeal the lifetime protection order ruling, taking her friend's money to hire lawyers to take on this appeal before discarding that friend. For all of the spring and summer of 2022, Lana continued to discuss her plans to appeal the case, brought attention to other protection orders she filed against friends or supporters of Vanessa, and also filed a defamation case against unmasked Vanessa and others that Lana believed to be affiliated with the unmasked YouTube channel. Lana's friend, who was her hired process server, was temporarily on the chopping block as well, since the judge found that the only credible person who testified at the protection order hearing was Vanessa. While Jamie was not allowed to sit at Lana's lunch table anymore, it seems to me that Jamie went to great lengths to get back in with Lana's circle of trust. Jamie got a hold of the police body cam footage of when Vanessa called the police the night before the hearing and aired it on the YouTube channel that she had just created. Jamie aired this body cam footage and turned this live stream into a mocking party and twisting the events that occurred to clear her name of the poor choices she made while acting as Lana's process server. Then, shortly after this, Lana gave a cryptic message in one of her live streams to Vanessa, saying that she wasn't the dangerous one to be worried about, but someone who lives in Colorado is, and she was going to warn Vanessa's attorneys about this person. Lana was referring to Jamie, her hired process server, but Lana never did notify Vanessa's attorneys about Jamie. The next day, Vanessa's dog was poisoned and went through what I can only imagine to be the most brutal suffering an animal can go through after being poisoned with an opioid painkiller. That matter is still currently under investigation, but it's worth adding to the timeline of events in my opinion. The chances of a dog being poisoned with the exact same medication that Shan Ann was poisoned with before she was murdered, and was also a part of the information that Vanessa had to notify authorities about after the admission about this was given to Vanessa and others with unmasked from a Watts family member, seems more than coincidental. But that's just me. Lana and Jamie he resumed their friendship after that tragic poisoning of Vanessa's dog took place. Instead of filing an appeal on the ruling of the permanent protection order in Colorado, Lana filed a civil protection order against Vanessa through the Ohio courts. In my opinion, this was done solely for retaliatory purposes and to rack up Vanessa's lawyer's fees, and was unnecessary on top of everything else considering that Vanessa had never once contacted Lana or anyone in Lana's real life ever and since this whole shit show started. Lana had this belief that she could only get a fair hearing if the case was held in the Ohio courts, so that was the emphasis and my personal interpretation any time I saw Lana hashtag the term home team or when she had home team productions as part of the intro and outro title of the documentary videos that Lana published on her YouTube channel. This is important to take note of for later when Vanessa's attorney brings up what Lana's YouTube channel's brand is. I personally believe that the home team phrase absolutely is a part of Lana's brand and goes along with Vanessa's attorney's line of questioning regarding that, but again, that's just my personal opinion. Too bad Lana's faith in her home team still didn't do her any favors on her civil protection order case against Vanessa. One last thing to add before we move on to Lana's lampoon litigation and lies part of this video, I just want to add that I don't believe that anyone has defamed Lana Oriani or her nonprofit except for Lana Oriani herself. If there ever was a case to be made for defamation, then why did Lana not go after all of the following content that was put out before Lana and Vanessa ever spoke and before Vanessa gave that heads up 
to her private Patreon audience to be careful with Lana's website, which again she was not wrong about. This woman Lana is the most disgusting piece of garbage I've ever come across on YouTube and, and Facebook. She pretends to be a dead Shanann Watts. That's right, a dead Shanann Watts and laughs about it and makes fun of Shanann. Now, but why I'm doing this is I'm appealing to all creators. Will you please, for the love of God, stop giving them airtime? Please, all of you. They start on shaking, spread out around the channels on their money-making trip that they're on. Stop giving them house room. I'm making this film to plead with creators. They've got nothing to say. They're there to blame Shanann. Get with the script, people. Don't let them on your channels, please. Now, I'm all for free speech. But when you see what this Lana's been doing to Shanann, I'm hoping you agree with me that you need to boycott them. No, let them have their own channels. Free speech. Don't put them on your channel and give them airtime and views and subscribers and money. It's got to stop now. You'll be sick watching this. I was sick making it. Please don't watch it if you're a nervous disposition. I thank those out too for exposing Shanann Rusak haters. Disgusting. Disgusting. I, I can't. I feel sick. I feel sick. Don't watch it. She's talking about boys are easier than yeah, girls to abort. About that. To me, like, <clears throat> I heard boys are just so much easier. <laughs> She's talking about boys are easier than yeah, girls to abort. Wait, Off if you're easily to tears, because it had me in tears. This is Lana. Lana's videos on Facebook. And some of you are having this woman on your channel. Shame on you. Then they were selling their patches. Oh, it's just been a 
horrid day I had to meet with the gang unit officers and explain that my kids are not in gangs, we do not sell drugs. Um, so it's just been, ugh, that's why I'm a hot mess, Sharon. So if you got any extra product on you, please. <laughs> um, I use a couple extra patches for my Tinder date, and I, um, I'm not gonna meet. Like, before the end of the month is up, I'm definitely gonna be out, so I'm gonna have to reorder. One job. Um, I'm gonna have to maybe make some alias names up so I can Okay, in case you missed it there, she's saying that Bella and Cece got kicked out of school because she put too many Thrive patches on their body and they went, uh, yeah. And then in that one video, she's dressed up her son as Bella. Hey guys, it's me, Shazam. We're doing our gender reveal tonight. Come on. Yeah. Come on. 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 Come Remember what you've seen here, because once you've seen it, you're never going to forget it. Don't give them your channel, because they will take it over and fill it full of poison against your man. Yeah, free speech. They can have their own channel. Keep them on their channel. Don't let them spread like some disease across true crime. We must still have some standards. Surely. Think again. Yeah, they will give you a large audience and numbers. Is that really what YouTube is about? Think again. Think what they've done. Think what they're planning. Think what their agenda is. Please. Lana, 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 I see that you've deleted a lot of stuff from your channel. However, I still see that there's a lot more stuff that still needs to be deleted immediately. Frankie Ruchek is on point about all of the harassment, bullying and bashing of his murdered family that has gone on for too long on social media. That is exactly what you are doing. You are the exact person that the Ruchek family should legally go after next for the absolute slander, defamation and emotional distress that you have absolutely done to this family. Dressing your friend up as Shanann? Dressing your son up as Bella? Are you mad? You say we are the twisted fucks for saying that you dressed up your child as a murdered victim. But sweetheart, since you put on a corpse Snapchat filter and pretend to be Shanann, is it really that off base to see that you're doing exactly just that? Dressing your child up as a child who was a victim of murder? You make me sick. Lana, I've actually done some research. And Lana, your content absolutely qualifies for harassment, bullying, slander, defamation, and more. I look forward to the day when your stupid, maniacal laugh turns into silent shame. The Ruchek family absolutely can go after you legally for your disturbing content that you've published, and I hope that they do. Lana, you need mental help, immediately. You are sick, and what you're doing is simply wrong. Your behavior also tells me that you're very jealous of Shanann, and of the good life that she had because it's a life that you will never experience or achieve for yourself. You really are one sick fuck. Lana, look at what you are doing. You are degrading children under the age of five who were murdered. You are degrading a pregnant woman who was murdered by her husband. How obvious it is that you are one miserable, pathetic, jealous little ninny who has to go to such disgusting extremes to feel better about yourself. I'm going to end this video or this little public service announcement here by saying, just unsubscribe from this buffoon. And Lana, you really should just continue deleting the rest of the foul ass shit that you've published online. You are not cute or funny, and I can't even believe that you thought that it was a good idea to even post that shit on a public forum. Again, you're an idiot. I'd hate to see what all you say and do privately. I imagine that it would be a massive problem for you if you were ever forced to turn over all of your devices and turn over all of your digital evidence for a legal matter, only then to have thousands of people online judging you for all of your flaws, which you and I both know that you have many. You would absolutely crumble and cry a victim if this kind of shit was being done to you. Even though what you have done 100% deserves the harshest judgments and the most vitriolic backlash for your vile actions and behavior. Shame on you. Most of the creators who made this content, Lana chose to befriend instead of suing them. Make that make sense. Again, I believe the optics of the Watts choosing to work with the person who mocked their murdered daughter-in-law and grandchildren was a really bad look.
on top of Lana's hastily planned publicity stunt to get Chris Watts, those famous 35C post-conviction release attorneys, without any way to pay them, was what sealed Lana's fate of failure. Lana's continued obsession with unmasked Vanessa, her friends and supporters, is extremely disturbing, especially her absolute disregard for the law and lack of respect for the courts as well. If not for Lana, I would not know as many details about Vanessa, and that really makes me sad for her because her privacy should have never been invaded the way that it was. I also would not be aware of all of the other court filings if not for Lana continuously bringing attention to the court docket. Keep in mind as you watch this last stretch of this video that this is not my case or anything that I have to prove. But how pathetic it is for Lana that I can so easily prove her lies and she couldn't present just one bit of evidence to support her version of truth. So with that in mind, if she can't help her own case, how the hell is anyone supposed to believe that she has the ability to help families dealing with much more serious legal matters? Lana is a clown and that's all she'll ever be in my eyes, but for everyone else who has been a target of her obsession and delusions, I am so very sorry for all you have had to endure, and I do hope this nightmare ends for you all sooner than later. Now would be a good time to pause, grab another snack, or maybe double that tequila for the upcoming parade of perjury. Um, as an initial matter, um, you testified that Ms. Walsh said, quote, let the credible one explain, end quote. You said that because the court in Colorado found that uh, Ms. Walsh credible and that you are not credible. Is that I said correct? said that because that's what Miss puts before she speaks when she makes any statements. Okay. And the court in Colorado found that Miss credible and that you are not. Right? Uh, the courts in Colorado said that Miss Walsh is the only credible witness here today. Correct. And so that implies that you are not credible. That would apply that I was not credible and nor were the other witnesses. Okay. So let's talk about the other witnesses. The other witnesses were your friends, Jamie and Sarah, right? You, Jamie Sarah, that was the first time I've ever met her. She drove from her home state to be there for you at that hearing, right? I have no idea why she drove there, actually. She advised... Okay, that's fine. Let me, I want to direct your attention to the transcript in this case. Um, so Ms. Kim and Ms. Abate were working together and were both hanging out with you, right? We were when? Um, both the night, be, uh, during the night before the hearing. He's here, I'm getting ready to serve him. Um, but where should we go? We should just go to like a, let's go to the Rusty Bucket. Let's go to the, I'm just kidding. These are all things that are in the Google search. Rusty Bucket. To the Victoria's Secret. Failed Colorado. Failed Colorado. Wait, we're going there? Well, yeah. Oh, wait, you just, are we going to go to Benny Hanna's then? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I don't care. I, I just wanted to, well, I wanted to see how far it was. Oh, it's only 11 miles? Let's do it. I got my producer working on this Netflix shit. So, all of you guys can be just as famous, because I'm gonna take all of the screenshots and put them all in a fucking, like, a bloody, uh, just a blood fest. The fuck? All right, guys, we made it home safely. We had had dinner the night before, uh, was it two nights before the hearing we had dinner? And um, I'm trying to re wait. recall, yeah, uh, yeah Saturday, I flew in Saturday. That's not, I don't need that part. Thank you. You were hanging out um, socially with Ms. Vanessa before that hearing, right? On Saturday. Sure, before the hearing. Yeah. Okay. And then um, you elicited testimony from Mr. Bull that Ms. Had Objection. Had conscripted what Ms. King. Hang on. What's your objection? Objection. As a lawyer, I was asking Mr. B questions. 
I don't understand. Huh. I don't understand what she's asking me. What's your question? Yeah, can you let me finish? You elicited testimony from Ms. Uh, indicating that Ms. was present as a witness for Ms. Wall, correct? That's what she was listed as a prosecution witness or um, a petitioner witness. So that would be Ms. Wall. You elicited testimony from Mr. Uh, that, um, that Ms. was his ex girlfriend and that she was present for Ms. Wall, correct? I never said he was. She was present for Miss. I said that. Ms. Moriani, he all heard the testimony as a pro, as a petitioner witness. Okay, so that's yes. your response. And, and I want to get back to that. There to testify. Miss 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 Attorney moved the courts to um, these two people that were supposedly supposed to be. Uh, witnesses that were relevant to the proceeding, not to contempt, and they were only supposed to be held there to testify to relevant material to Miss current TPO. Miss Oriani, I want to be clear. I, I'm trying to highlight the fact that you, through Mr. B listed testimony, and it sort of suggesting that Miss was his ex girlfriend and was there for Miss suggesting there was some surreptitious thing going on. I'm trying to clarify the fact I that Miss Kim is there for you in Colorado. Wait, so I'm being questioned right. on the way that I question somebody? No. Yes. Well, I, okay. The way I'm taking it is, is she's saying when you were uh, examining Mr. You asked him about Miss Kim's ex-girlfriend and the fact that she was there in I Colorado just, as Miss and I, I, that's the testimony you listed it from him, correct? He just said that he was that Sarah, his ex girlfriend, mm -hmm. and Sarah was a petitioner witness. Okay, all right. So okay. was not, she there? But you were hanging out with Miss socially prior. Miss hotel room separate from where I was staying. Yes. After she got into that. She was sleeping in that bed all the way on the left-hand side. I'm all the way on the right-hand side. All of a sudden, at some point, she got up out of bed. I do not know the time because I was sleeping. So on the, the Sunday before the protection order hearing, which was on March 7th, Again, you caused... This line of questioning, but that's fine. You caused this is Ms. Kim to serve a subpoena at Ms. Kim's home, correct? Absolutely not. I never testified to that in court in um, Colorado. I want to direct um, your attention to page 188 of the transcript from the March 7th hearing. Line 16. Did I give you that? Um, the book? I, I think you have the binder because I was bringing I, up the different. I gave it back to you. The one that had all the writing on it. roll through this transcript for whatever reason right now. Um, I can read it. I have it right here. Well, I would, if you want to read it, you can while I'm trying to fix this and then we can okay. talk about that. Thank you. So I'm looking at page, uh, starting at page 143. Oh, 143, okay. Uh, where Ms. testifies on lines 23. The question is, so you were hired by Ms. to do what? And Ms. says to serve papers. And she said, how much did she pay you? And she said, we have not settled that yet. Mm -hmm. Then she says that Ms. gave her papers to serve. It was, um, and Ms. Oriani, it was a subpoena for who is Ms. husband, right? Allegedly. That is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. Well, she told me that um, it was her. I knew as her. Uh, they were. What was it? <sighs> separated. So, OK, that's it's the, the husband. They were. It was a subpoena for. Correct. At Ms. Yeah, I don't know what his Correct. title is. Yeah. Doesn't matter. He lives with her, right? I don't I have no idea. I the home. The address that the address that this was served at was Ms. 
home the night before the hearing, correct? I didn't provide the address. Ms. Oriani, you were present at the hearing just like I was. Mm -hmm. Ms. Ms. served. The dispute was over one or two subpoenas. It wasn't over one was served. The that wasn't the only dispute. A subpoena at his home address, correct? I d I did not supply an address for the, for anything to do with this. I didn't ask if you supplied an address. I, so I don't I know said, where they went. I don't know who owns the home. Ms. Oriani, you're you're skirting the issue. What I'm saying is, a subpoena was served on at his home, correct? It was served at a residence. Yeah, that he was at. I don't know whose home it is. I don't know that. Yes, he was. I don't know. Well, you now know it was. House, wasn't it? Well, I, was it her house? Was it his house? I don't know that. I'm not going to testify. You that know, know now that it was her house, don't you? Or do you know if she lived there? Miss w Mr. W we'll start with Miss. W yes. Do I believe that Miss w lives there now? Yes. Do I believe that Mr. W lives there now? I have no idea. Before, I have no idea. I did not know where any of these people lived. But he was served with a subpoena at that home. And I correct? did not tell. I did not supply this address Who that was, they went to. Why I don't was know what he? To tell you. Was he being subpoenaed? Somebody subpoenaed him. Who? Who was subpoenaing? I'm not saying. I subpoenaed. I subpoenaed two people on February 17th or 18th. Okay. And, and so I, you, you just said, go then, find Mr. W I don't know where he lives. And so then, correct? Who, who, because I was being accused of stalking. I wasn't going to look up anybody. Okay. So you're saying. Saying that they got him served somewhere and how they found that address you don't know and you don't know what that address was at the time that's what you're telling me y yes because that's what my process server said and actually i talked to my process server and i said i got a quash subpoena here emailed her that on february 28th when miss zimmerman quashed the minor child subpoena sent it over to her um because i was under the impression that these were actually already served because I thought that on February 18th when I had gotten them and she went and did all that, I thought that they were done. Okay, so I have but, no idea. But my I did this paperwork and, and, we're, and was down there February 18th, February 18th. So, and for the record, in order to serve a minor, you have to serve both minor uh, parents. That's how you, you have to do it the right way. I know that. She hasn't even been, she hasn't been served yet. I know, like, how you have to do it. I don't you think she's been served Fine. yet. Okay, so, I have no but, idea. but my question is, that day that somebody showed up to serve Mr. W even though you were the one that wanted him subpoenaed, yes, you correct. had no idea how they got that address? A hundred percent. Okay, all right, next question. Okay, so, um, the court found that you caused that subpoena to be served, and that you also caused a subpoena to be served on Ms. W minor child, even though that had been quashed, right? The courts found what? Um, I can refer you didn't to page rule on that. That's a transcript. I didn't believe that the courts ruled on that because they said that they wouldn't rule on. Okay. The court did rule on that. It's so I I have located where the court ruled on that. Um, so was it on page one eighty eight? This letter. No, I'm sorry. That was you are correct. Um, On page 208, line nine, um, in the court found um, I'm, that I'm she- I'm sorry, what page there. number again? Uh, 208. 208, thank you. Okay, go on. Um, she said, I'm going to leave that up to the police and the district attorney's office to figure out whether or not they believe probable cause exists. And she is referring to violation of protection order. But I can tell you that I did not find Ms. <laughs> testimony or Ms. Or Ms testimony credible either that that there was nothing about what happened in the serving of the subpoenas and there were two subpoenas served i don't find that it was credible to assert anything but that that was done only for the purpose of harassment that that was done there is no legitimate reason first of all for the minor child be am served i quashed that let me double check my date on that i had quashed the protection order back on the 20th of february um she is referring to the fact that is a court finding that both subpoenas were served that it was not timely uh, and that it was done solely for the purpose of harassment. Uh, 
Um, I next want to address um, was there a Ms. question Oriana. or was that what, okay, she testifying? Listen, stop. What was before we got to that? What was pending was Miss Zimmerman asked you. Did the court find that you, meaning you, Ms. Oriani, caused the subpoenas to be served? You said... And I'm saying that... Let let me talk. You said, no, that the court never ruled on that issue, which the question pending was whether you caused the subpoenas to be served. And Ms. Zimmerman, was your point to try to impeach her? Yes, Your Honor. And it was also to impeach her because she previously... Um, during her direct indicated that no subpoenas had been served and that the entire thing was made up when she was talking about the CAD reports. I was reading what the CAD report said. Okay, she had you read that for purposes of impeachment, okay? But you can respond. I'm going to leave that up to the police in the district attorney's office. As to whether there's probable cause. Correct. But she then goes up, the magistrate then went on to say that she didn't find this. Ab- so what, that's what I'm asking, correct. what's the question? Did the court- Ms. Oriani, that was, that okay. was impeachment for your previous testimony indicating that no subpoenas were served. I never said so that no she's subpoenas asking you, were served. Listen, so what she's asking you is, is that not a ruling the court made? I, I'm. I never said that. Yes no, or no. Is that the, accurate what you read? Okay. Yeah. What she just read, the court said, absolutely. I okay. never said that there was no subpoena served. Okay. Let's move on. You asked me if I, I orchestrated. You asked me if I orchestrated the subpoenas. I said, no, absolutely not. That's what I she didn't asked ask me. I didn't cause them to be served. I did not cause and them to be served. Did the court find that? I did. That you, you testified you. a moment ago that you you obtained them and thought they had already been served indicating that you did cause them to be served so i don't have any yeah, other on the 20 yet. on the what i just i testified to i got them through the courts on the 18th i filed for them jamie had to go down to the uh, i don't live in colorado she went down to broomfield to get them there was actually five not two five i miss i was i never testified to any of this because you didn't cross-examine me and Ms. Oriani, one, one of those um, subpoenas was for Ms. daughter, who's 14 years old, right? And that was quashed. And it should, and it was. And it should, and it was. Okay, that's not her saw, question. Listen to her question. So that's yes or no. Was one of them for Ms. daughter, who's 14? Yes, who Ms. into the TPO. She put her daughter in the TPO. Said that she said, said that she gave her a picture of me. That was a yes or no question from me. It is a yes or no question. Yes, yes. I, I'm Thank not you. disputing that. Okay. Okay. So now I want to move on. Um, you have made a big deal out of the fact that Ms. Walsh is referring to as a stalker. Um, the court found that you were stalking Ms. Walsh, correct? I don't know if they use, I don't know, did they use the word soccer? I mean, the court, whatever the court yes. found, can you refer, like, I mean, can you? Show yes, me? if you go to page 204, starting at line 14, it says, so it brings the court back to, it brings the court back to 183602. Uh-huh. That is the stalking statute in Colorado. And she explains, um, beginning there, the different categories of stalking. And then she find, she states that she previously thought this fell under 1C only, but now believes it also falls under 1B. So um, Magistrate Russell in Colorado found yes. specifically- Yes, Ms. Russell believed that two stalking. subpoenas, yes, Ms. Magistrate, Sunshine when she's gone, and she's always gone too long. Anytime 
Magistrate Russell believed that two subpoenas were served, one which was one which was to um, uh, the quash subpoena of her minor daughter, and she believed that that's what had happened. Is that what? No, she's asking, yes, did the magistrate rule that you were stalking this? Yes, she, re she reads a bunch of different things that you could either cause a third party to. She believed that I caused a third party to go to Miss home. Yeah, he's here. I'm getting ready to serve him. Um, oh my gosh. Um, when I was coming home from, you know, my little mission the other day, Toyota pickup hit, hit one of these trees, like head on, and it... It was like jacked up. I don't know what happened. How, how oh, this Toyota, like that Friday when I oh, okay, went yeah, to yeah. do that stuff, and I came back. This Toyota truck had hit one of those trees head on, but it wasn't snowy or anything. Which Magistrate is a form Russell of stalking, found. I guess. What's your question? Magistrate Russell found that you were stalking Ms. <laughs> pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute 1314-106, correct? Yes, I left with a PPO. It was for stalking. Okay. I'm a loser, baby. Okay. So, in referring to you as a stalker, there is a court order identifying you as someone who's stalking Ms. Walsh, correct? No, not stalking people. No, stalking Ms. Walsh. That's exactly what I said. No, you said people. Okay. All right. I did not. Keep going. Okay. There is a court order identifying you as someone who's stalking Ms. Walsh, correct? That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So, I want to talk about how often you posted about the protection order. I clearly don't have proof of all of the live streams and community posts that Lana published since many were deleted, in addition to me playing catch up. But I do have enough to prove that Lana is about to lie big time here in a minute. <laughs> Just playing hide and go seek over here. Now you see me, now you don't. Welcome. What is up? What's up, Vanessa? Vanessa Mass just did this to me and my son. I'm going to wait for everybody to get in chat. He's here. I'm getting ready to serve Stop. him. Um, um, and how many months is that before the engagement with her?
You have no idea how much you helped me with something, which I'm able to show, in, in, you know, in the courtroom for a huge part of the, the whole perjury and um, due diligence when we did the whole, um, when we all did the IP address stuff and come to find out that, holy shit, this broad testified that, and had her, and her lawyer testified that that IP address traced back to her zip code. It didn't. It traced back to his zip code. So she was never doxxed, right? If her lawyers would have done the due diligence of that, but you're just allowing any type of fucking evidence in there and, and spinning it any way you want. We came together to do that, right? I appreciated you for it. I understood your position before that when you couldn't say anything and, and that, hey, it is what it is, right? Well, I think it's just gotten to the point that it's, it's too far. They got a T, they got a TRO, right? And they well, did it to fabricate and manipulate evidence. So how far are they willing to go to do the same thing with evidence as we've seen them do it before? Why wouldn't they do the same thing in a, to try to get me in some type of trouble that never occurred on a criminal level? And we are so and close. The CAD notes. The body cam footage. All of this proves that Vanessa Walsh did perjury. But not only did she commit perjury, her lawyer aided in it because she called her lawyer before she ever called the police. And she testified that she called the police first. That means that her lawyer knew in that instant that she was testifying falsely. That's misconduct. To the point of sanctions. Mm, eat glass. And that's just one... 30th of what has been going on. Who needs to lie to get a, a, a TRO? They fucked the dog with. So now she, your honor, I do want to add, so that was back in the beginning and I think that's page, whatever I have, I have I've already done my whole damn appeal. Um, so following what happened last both the temporary and then the permanent protection order. Um, you did a live video that was going on while you were served, right? I was on a live broadcast. Okay. And then you did a follow-up where you solicited money indicating that that had harmed your son being served, right? I did a live broadcast right after doing what? So after no, I did not ask served, for money on a live broadcast, if that's what you're insinuating. You did you guys ever come live? I'm doing, um, this is special. This is a special live. I created a PayPal. It's very simple. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. Um, and definitely what happened to uh, my son and myself on Monday night was wrong. But what's crazier about it is, is that the guy knew what he was doing because he said, I know that you're live and I saw you live and he knew that my son was there. I have a problem with that. Again, I want to thank people that have uh, donated. I also want to thank, uh, even if it's just a dollar um, or if you share the link, you can't, you know, people don't have money and that's, there's other ways to, to support and you can just share it.
ask for you asked for money um, for your son because of the distress. I didn't ask for money for my son. I asked. for um, if I had a uh, GoFundMe account to travel to Denver. To, to fight the unjust that was placed upon me. In Ms. Oriani, you called that justice for Jax, right? Yes, I called it justice for Jax. Right? Re objection, relevancy in, to any of this. Ms. Oriani. So I'm going to overrule the relevancy is because a, a lot of your case is about the fact of the things they're saying on the internet. Oh, yeah. And so... So yeah, she's I allowed started, to yeah, talk. I, I, she's yeah, allowed I, I, to I, I ask go, you what you are conversely saying about oh, yeah, the case too. About okay? my son? Yes. So you were raising money under a group called Justice for Jax, right? It wasn't a group. I had a PayPal thing. Really do. I don't know how you do it, but they're listening to you. But not for long because I know the truth will always out. And then they'll see the real you and not leave them any doubt that you're a faking, two-faced, scheming, narcissistic, selfish rot, and a lying, cheating, gaslighting, manipulating. You can do to fundraise. Fundraise. The definition of fundraise is to seek financial support for a charity, cause, or other enterprise. An example of fundraising used in a sentence is, Lana was fundraising to pull off her publicity stunt. And the, the harm that Jax had suffered was that you were served with the temporary protection order, right? No, that was not the harm that Jax had suffered. The harm that you posted about was a process server coming to your home. Yeah, and... Okay, so then you were served with papers. And asking you, I'm gonna go step by step. After you were served with the temporary protection order, you did a broadcast about it, right? No. You already testified that you did and that when you did, No, I did money. not. You handed me this oh, thing that this was my stuff and I testified that no, it's not. I'm not, fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking well, about then, you testified that you were broadcasting about the temporary protection order after you were served because everyone saw you get served, right? What? I don't know. I, I, don't, I literally don't know what you're, I don't, when? Okay. Did you broadcast at all about the TPO after, after you were served? I know about the t about the PO. Yeah, about the case in Colorado. No, I said that I was appealing the case. When you were served, are no, you telling? No, I did not go live. But you let me finish. finish. Okay. Sorry. I'm not talking about the appeal. I'm talking about when the case got initiated out in Colorado. Are you telling this court you never broadcast anything about it? Talked about it? No, I said I, I testified here that I did talk about it. Okay. I did. What was the first time you talked about it? Can you remember? I when we did the me and me and Jamie a bit, she posted a video and did a reactionary video. That's the first time you talked about it. Okay. All right. Yeah, like I I talked about it, um and No, I, I we were told not to be talked about. That's why I took it to my lawyer. I had I had a lawyer all the way until June no. eighth. Miss Ms. Oriani, we're talking about two different parts of the case. I'm going back to last January. So you te you just testified that you did broadcast, and I don't know the difference between a live and a, you know, showing a reaction or whatever. I'm asking if you have content discussing these things in a forum on your YouTube channel, okay? It covers all of the possible ways. Okay. So, we know that you were served during a live. You then just testified that you did um, broadcast other content or show other content reacting to that. Then you previously testified that you did um, a video about your preparations for coming to Denver in February, right? On January 18th, okay. 2022. Then, that, then the, the, at the first protection order hearing, it was continued to the March date, correct? To March, it was continued to March 7th. Correct. 
So when you showed up in February, it was continued for a month, right? Uh, yeah, on January 28th, 27th, okay. it was continued until March 7th. Okay. So then you also broadcast not so we, just this is all the stuff that we're talking about objection relevance and other things we're talking about I thought that we're not talking about things that were questioned in what was it Colorado oh. so I, I guess if you're, if you're talking to me about damage. what I did between um, January um, whatever I was served until the time that I had my TPO hearing is that what you're saying? I am Miss Oriani, yes. Okay, and this was all, um, you had an opportunity to cross-examine me when I took the stand in Denver and you didn't. I, I, I did, but that at that has time nothing you to do with this. Okay, she's um, asking, she's raising an objection to relevance. Can you explain what the relevance of this line of questioning is, Ms. Zimmerman? Yes, I can. The only really cognizable thing that she has said in support of her um, position in this case is that the protection order was incorrectly entered and that the existence of it is causing her pain and mental distress. The fact that she is constantly broadcasting about it indicates that it is not any conduct of Ms. or probably honestly anyone else that is causing people to know about this case. It is her own conduct. Okay, uh, actually, uh, stop. Can I come? You don't have to argue. You wanted to know what the relevance yes. was. She's explained why she's at the line of questioning. I'm not saying that I agree or disagree. Oh, what I'm saying is, yes, this is a relevant line of questioning. Okay. I'm going to let her continue. Perfect. The other thing is you did, from the court's perspective, you brought up you brought up how much everybody else talks about it. Oh, absolutely. So this is fair game. I just, I just want to make sure though, it that- It just is, okay? That's, you don't I have, agree. I agree. That's the court's ruling. You need to answer the questions. Go on. So, Ms. Oriani, isn't it true that when you landed in Denver for the March 7th hearing, you immediately did a live um, broadcast of the car, all of your preparations, and your time no, with Ms. Oriani? This is going to get really long if I have to admit all the same evidence from Ms. the original Ms. Colorado. Ms. Zimmerman, I went live when, I, when Jamie picked me up from the airport to say that I touched okay. down. I didn't show anything from my car. I didn't, it, it wasn't my car. It was, Did it you was go? in Miss And car. it wasn't about the case. It was, we, we went to dinner. Okay. It's so, my personal life. Right. What okay. I'm, um, what's, what, where should we go? We should just go to like a, let's go to the Rusty Bucket. Let's go to, <laughs> I'm just kidding. These are all things that are in the Google search. Rusty Bucket. Let's go to Victoria's Secret. Phil Colorado. How far? Phil Colorado. Wait, we're going there? Well, yeah. Oh, wait, you just, are we going to go to Benihana's then? Um, if, yeah, sure. Um, I don't care. I, I just wanted to, well, I wanted to see how far it was. Oh, well, I wanted to see how far it was. Oh, it's my 11 miles. Let's do it. Talking about Ms. Oriani, I'm not saying but I wasn't you, talking, talking about, about the case. case. Ms. Oriani, I'm not gonna let her I am bully. not saying you're talking about the case. I'm saying that you turned this entire thing into part of your brand. No, you I did not. That's absolutely not true. That is not you were true. talking about the fact that you landed in Denver and absolutely everyone knew Absolutely not true. I didn't turn this into anything. I turned, I was attacked. Ms. Oriani. I was, and, and I was told I was going to be getting arrested when I landed. You're damn right I'm going to be recording. The, I was Sorry, so she lands, she's getting arrested. She lands, I can't wait to see her in cuffs. I can't wait to see her in cuffs. Why don't you try doing that every single day when they're posting and Miss on that saying, she up, just guys, just wait for it. It's happening. I can't talk about it right now, but it's happening. Just wait for it. Um, Lana's going to prison. Lana's going to, Lana's going to prison. She's going to be there for 15 to 20 every single day. Ms. That's Oriana, what I deal with every no single day. The there is no evidence in the record saying that that happened. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I'll make sure that it comes up in cross. Went live as soon as you landed in Denver, and then you also have had various sort of whether you call them reactions or lives or whatever, discussing your appeal and your case, right? Not in not when. No, I did not talk about this. When are you referring to? I'm talking about the myriad videos that you posted during the course of the summer when your appeal was pending. For the spring. I did not post videos about this. Or any content. No, what I 
Brianna, you posted a video accusing me personally of perjury and unethical behavior that I watched. Miss is that Zimmerman, incorrect? there has been one video where all of that took place one time, and it had to do with the CAD notes, it had to do with the body cam, and it was Miss Abay put that out there that I had a reactionary to because I didn't even know it existed. I had Man, asked you, I had emailed you, sorry, you have the CAD Stop. notes. Ms. Oriani, I am literally just asking if you posted it. That's it. I'm it saying like no. I'm saying I posted one video and that was all in one and it was a reactionary video oh, to Miss Abeda. Well, I just heard out of what you said is that you posted one video. So that's great. I'm going to move on. Okay. I have never heard someone say so many wrong things, one after the other, consecutively in a row. But listen to me, Ms. Oriani. Is there an appeal pending right now? Because I understand you believe you can still file your appeal, but have you? Is there an appeal yeah, pending? I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. So I'm not. I, no. I'm saying. I'm saying. Me, no. There's. There's. I was told that I could uh, do a. Um, I was told that I can file for. Um, Consideration. Yes. Have you done that? I, I've been doing all of this. Oh no. So no. Okay. It's, I mean, I, no, it's in the process. All right, we can go round and round for yeah. two hours about the status of the appeal. But what I'm hearing is there's no appeal pending. She believes she's entitled to file a motion for reconsideration, but she has not done so. Okay. And I guess I don't understand the relevancy of this. I have because one last you, question. Okay. You brought up that they thwarted your ability to file an appeal. I got so you. So that's why it's relevant. Go on. So I have one other question um, because, uh, Ms. Oriani, I think this is an important component of how you have continued discussing this case and how it has been for you. Isn't it accurate that you made official courtroom merchandise before the protection order hearing in this case? Absolutely in not. In the Colorado case? Absolutely what? not. No courtroom apparel. Oh. Jamie, if I didn't do that. People, that's what, they, that's what they're doing. They're... I didn't, I didn't do anything like that. So you My channel doesn't have any merchandise available to buy on it. You have to have a merchandise. It says, quote, Okay, first of all, as you just saw, the courtroom merchandise wasn't the first time Lana advertised selling t-shirts on her YouTube channel. Secondly, Lana does have a business in the state of Ohio and stated on March 6, 2021 that she has a seller's permit. So how do we know that she's not selling merchandise, just not off of YouTube's platform? Third, the first set of shirts look so similar to the one that Lana claimed to be Jamie's shirt. If they are all Jamie's shirts, why is she ruining so many of her personal t-shirts by putting Lana's face, but not Lana's face, on so many of them? Huh, that's weird. Lastly, eight days after this hearing, Lana is advertising once again on her YouTube channel, the launch of new merchandise, featuring that home team productions that I believe is Lana's brand, based off Lana's belief that she has a better chance at prevailing on all of her cases, so long as they are in Ohio. Before Lana landed the wave of riding the Idaho 4 case and destroying that case coverage with bullshit conspiracy theories too, Lana was focused on nothing but taking legal action against many YouTube creators and how she was going to blow up or burn down Watts Island. Secondary to Shazam, I believe that Lana filing lawsuits is what she was known for, so much so that she made it into tabloid magazine for her lawsuits. So, yeah, I would say that Lana being a vexatious loser litigant is absolutely Lana's brand. Truth and transparency, however? Hmm, not so much. If you are a new subscriber to Truth and Transparency, yeah, you'll definitely see a different side of true crime, minus any truth. For sale, there's no merchandise button on my channel. I don't have any further questions. Lana's inner voice is too loud to hear reality. She can't even hear when she's committed perjury or found to be a stalker by a court of law and now has a lifetime protection order against her for failing to hear or see what the rest of us do. Be careful with that one, including her enablers. Any questions?
Listen, sometimes it's okay to be the villain and the made up story that these people got going on in their mind. Because <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I'm okay. I'm okay that in your story, I'm the villain. Because you're the clown in mine. <laughs> A whole clown.